Sally, you've heard it all because you wrote it. Um, so, but Sally Tisdale is the author of seven books, and the one I'm sure most people have heard of is Talk Dirty to Me, and also The Best Thing I Ever Tasted, and, and that book um, was a finalist for the James Beard Award for Writing. And her essays have appeared in such publications as Harper's, Antioch Review, Vogue, Reader's Digest, The New Yorker, Tricycle, and Esquire. And I have a little story that I just want to tell real quickly. Um, I was talking to someone about, someone I work with has this headache that he's had since August. And I was telling someone I work with, I said, you know, Scott's had this, I mean, uh, Jason's had this headache since, since August. And she says, oh, there was this article in, in um, Harper's about this one, you know, a woman had a headache, and, and, and she says, wait a minute, that person who's coming to your cultural forum, she wrote it. And so I had to go find the article, and Sally wrote this article about this headache that she had for how long? Yeah, a year. I mean, it was just like the forever headache. So I, I, I copied the article and I read it and, and uh, because we have Harper's, so we, I read it and um, I'm gonna give a copy to Jason so that he can find someone to, that can relate to him about the headache. Um, Sally is the 2013 recipient of the Regional Arts and Culture Council Literary Fellowship. She has received an NEA Fellowship in Bell Let uh, Pushcart Prize, the James Phelan, Phelan, Phelan. Literary Award, the American Journal of Nursing Book of the Year Award, a Pope Foundation Award, and was a Dorothy and Arthur Schoenfeldt Distinguished Writer of the Year. And you're a nurse, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is very interesting that you know, she does all this writing and she's also a nurse. Um, her essay, Scars, won the Council for the Advancement and Support of, National, of, of Educational National Gold, Gold Medal for Feature Writing. And she's been a guest writer and teacher at the University of California, Davis, University of Montana, New York University, the Medill, is it Medill or Medill? Medill School, School of Journalism, Antioch University West, Reed College, and the Omega Institute. And on her website, she had this one thing I just wanted to read, which is like, why am I reading it? She should just be the one reading this, because these are her words, and I just thought it was very nice. Um, if the world's wisdom traditions have anything in common, if there is a truth that seems to cross methodology, it is this. Stick to something. Say yes to one thing, one way in particular. This means you must mostly say no to everything else. The hard truth of the truths we're told is that discomfort and fulfillment lie side by side entwined with scary and sometimes lonely inner work. Like religion, art is as much as anything else about the long haul. When I read that, I was just like, oh, I can't wait to hear her speak. So please, here comes Sally. Thank you. And if sounds like I have two careers as a nurse and a, I'm, I'm a nurse because you got to pay the rent and writing doesn't always do that and uh, it frees me up to write what I really want to write. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, the, the title of this talk is Lost Again. Um, it's a combination of reading some material that's not been published yet and talking about Travel writing and writing about travel, um, we always talk about travel writing as a genre, but um, it's a very hard beast to nail down what travel writing is. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna start by reading about uh, some material about um, Uganda. I've been going to southwestern Uganda to a particular village there for six, seven, I've been there six times, so seven years now, I'm due for a trip. I started out going on a, a, a medical trip to volunteer at a little clinic there, and it was primarily, this is how I can get to East Africa. This is how I can um, find the money and find the time and make it happen. And I, it, I know how many of you have had this experience of showing up in a place that you never thought you would ever feel at home, and it felt like home. 
I walked off the plane and I felt like I was coming home. It was amazing. So I immediately felt that I had to keep coming back to Uganda and I've since made friends and, and uh, uh, found, I don't, I no longer, they no longer need us at the clinic. I no longer go there for that reason at all. Um, so, and I also have some material from a trip I recently took to India. Um, so I'm gonna alternate back and forth. Is the sound good? The best flights are out of Holland, where my taxi driver wears a suit and tie. The cobbled streets of Amsterdam have one lane for cars, one for bikes, a set of tracks for the smooth rolling tram, and wide sidewalks with pedestrians who calmly wait for the light. To go from Holland to Uganda is to go from waking to a dream, but I'm never sure which is which. Once I sat on the plane next to an Australian pediatrician who was part of a team planning to open a neonatal intensive care unit. He had a bookmark with English on one side and Luganda on the other. The phrases included, welcome, good morning, sir, what beautiful weather we are having, and I am sorry that your baby has died. The flight into Entebbe lands late in the evening. The first time I went to Uganda, we descended into blackness. No splatter of lights warmed the land, only a flicker here and there, a brief bit of yellow spots, a silhouette of low buildings blacker than the clouded velvet sky. We stepped out onto the tarmac into moist, warm air and the scent of smoke, which is never completely absent. Here on the belt of the world, there are 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night. After sunset, the entire valley is dark with only a single light bulb in the distance and the wash of headlights through the trees. The clinic blazes in comparison. We gather at the picnic tables so we can share a light bulb, which sometimes sputters out. We play hearts in Shanghai. Ronnie teaches us the Ugandan version of Parcheesi, and when he begins to win, he raises his hands and smiles. I am very prestigious. Then he looks over at me. Sally, do you booze, he asks, offering a bottle of whiskey. We watch the sheet lightning that sprays silently over distant hills. I leave the table, stand under the carpet of stars for a time, and then crawl into the mosquito net sanctuary of the little bottom bunk to read by headlamp. I drift into sleep in the cocoon of net, listening to the chirruping choir of insects and birds filling the air with strange organic cries, tweedles and moans, gurgles and clicks. At midnight, I walk to the latrine. Everyone else is asleep. The full moon is white as phosphor, and I stand alone on the hill above the clinic for a long time, feeling whole and healed for a while. The strange light spills like paint across the mango and jackfruit trees. It is so quiet I can hear the inarticulate shh of the bats as they swoop past me unseen. From the brick hut across the road, a baby cries for a moment. Then a man coughs wearily once, twice. I have come here in part to discover what I do not know. To discover that is, ignorance of which I am not even aware. What does it mean to be a visitor, to belong, to be home? I am just trying to see clearly as far as I can see, trying to see through the fog that makes it hard to see another, to see any other. Now and then I am struck by a kind of lightning rod of separation, not from Africa or Ugandans, but from people struck by what seems my own occult inability to be close to anyone, to feel safe, to ever be able to see others as anything but other. Can I possibly hope to overcome this in a place so far from home? But I dream of Uganda when I am away from it. I dream that I am walking down the damp red clay road after the morning rain, the mud sticky under my shoes, the air fragrant with faint rot and flowers and earth. I dream that I am standing under the froth of stars as though in a shallow sea. Oh, it just makes me want to go back. <laughs> I've got to get back. 
So when I started to think about this, I thought, what is the purpose of travel? What is it that drives us to go? And who is a good traveler? We all sort of know the answer to that. And I think a good traveler is required for a good travel writer. But being a good writer doesn't make you a good travel writer. The answers for me about why I travel, what travel is for, has something to do with this finding who is, who is the other. Who am I as an other to other people? It also has to do with how we become engaged with the world and what our curi how our curiosity manifests itself. And there's something in there akin to nostalgia and fantasy that I'm always trying to put my finger on. Christopher Isherwood said a good travel book was perhaps a little like a crime story in which you're in search of something. And actually, I'd say that every good book is a crime story. Every good book is a detective story. It's everything, we're always looking for something. And a good traveler is always looking. It might be a Siberian crane. It might be a view of the Parthenon at dusk. Peace of mind. I once went to London seeking an original vinyl of the Yardbirds having a rave up album, and I found it. We go looking for love or a recipe for gumbo. It's something that we can't find at home, or we think we can't find at home. But when I think about why do I go to foreign places, why do I have a hunger to see places I've never seen before, to return to places I've been before, the main reason is always just to go. There's an impulse. Paul Fussell is a, a, a travel writer and an editor, and he it, uh, was famous for calling 1918 to 1939 the golden age of travel, and he did uh, anthologies of travel writing from that time. But people have been describing golden ages for a long time, and uh, whenever I hear something's a golden age, I figure there was one before that. It's invariably before you were born. It's always the longed-for past. That the, that's always better than the present. We always imagine something unspoiled or, or shimmering with promise in the past, something that feels more real than this feels. And that's partly what I mean by the nostalgia of travel. I think we are looking for that feeling, that sense that there's something more. And in that sense, there is, there is real difference between classic travel writing um, from that golden age and modern travel writing. How many of you have read uh, Mary Kingsley's Travels in West Africa? 1897, great book. Robert Byron wrote books in the 1930s. He wrote a wonderful book called First Russia, Then Tibet. Doesn't that just make you want to go? Right there. And he wrote a, a book called The Road to Oxiana about what was then Eastern Europe. Freya Stark wrote a great autobiography. This woman broke up a relationship in her 30s, taught herself Arabic, and spent the next 12 years in the Middle East. Uh, she even became something of an amateur cartographer and, and mapped out entire valleys. These people, people like Byron and Kingsley and Stark, traveled because they loved to travel, they wanted to travel, they were hungry for new experiences. They wanted to test themselves in the world. I get uncomfortable when I travel, but when I read these books, I re am reminded what discomfort and danger really can be like. You can barely imagine. They wrote because they were storytellers. They had an amazing courage and a great sense of adventure. But their work is marked with a distinct sense of home. They always traveled to a place and wrote from a place. Modern travel writing often is distinguished by a sense of rootlessness, this attempt to find a global identity, to not really belong anywhere. Classic travel writing really has a rooted sense. And they are themselves characters in the narrative only by the happenstance of being there. They're not the story. And some of these books are cranky as all get out. 
some of these some of these narrators are are quite cranky, but there's a real generosity of spirit about what's next around the corner. I always wish that I'd been invited along on these trips. And I don't feel that way about modern travel writing. There's a, a peculiar smallness of spirit as the as our world expands, um, there's a concomitant ennui that seems to infect us. Instead of this transparent curiosity and generosity that I see with the older writers, there's a kind of boredom, even a showmanship, in a lot of modern travel writing. Very gifted writers, their books sometimes suffer from hindsight and self-importance. And by hindsight, I mean the narrator doesn't grow or transform in any way in the book. They start out being smarter than everybody else and they finish being smarter than anybody else. And that's part of the detective story. The detective doesn't know the answer at the beginning. They have to transform. So I, I never wish I was along on these trips. I'm often very glad I'm not, but I also realize they wouldn't have invited me. <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of these books I come across, I just close them and think, I wouldn't have been welcome. I'm actually really shocked at how xenophobic modern travel writing can be. Underneath the skin of this, I'm a global traveler and the world, is, the boundaries of the world are, are dissolving, there's a kind of dismissal of entire countries, entire races of people. Um, I'm gonna give you a few quotes that I find kind of amazing, Fussell, Wonderful Paul Fussell. He made a list. Barbados, Hong Kong, the Greek islands, Fiji, they're all over. Nothing but tourists. Martinique, Bermuda, and the Dominican Republic. Don't bother. Entire countries. No point in going at all. Diane Johnson has said many times in various ways that Americans are boring and hideous to travel with and the last person she wants to talk to. She's from the Midwest. Paul Theroux, who many people think of as one of the, our, our better travel writers, is really racist. I won't bother with much, but he dismisses the entire South Pacific. He calls it fat land. He calls the French uh, narcissists. He calls the Japanese a dull little people. You read, you read these books and I come across this and I'm like, the entire country. Edna O'Brien, of all people, a wonderful writer, she wrote an essay about going to see Michelangelo's David, and she was disgusted because hordes of tourists had descended. That's the way she put it. And they were not, she said, real travelers, not like her. So it's kind of like, if you're a vegetarian, do you also hate the butcher? If you want to see the David, do you hate everybody else who wants to see the David? There's a, there, there's a real aversion to humanity in some of this writing. A few more things from Paul Theroux, and I pick on him a little bit because very few people pick on him. Um, he's really the example of how travel doesn't seem to broaden everybody. Uh, he's really solemn. He's really displeased with a lot of what he sees. Uh, he calls people names like the zombie. Japanese, these little people, a one race, one language, one family island of desperate overachievers. The French, insincere, unprincipled, unreliable. Just like that. He often seems to spend half of his time trying to pretend he's not a foreigner. And I'm going to come back to that, that experience. He has a, a, he's in Australia, and he wants to get weather advice from this fisherman, but he realizes... He says, if I asked him this, he would have laughed and mocked me for being a bloody yank and a tourist. So he doesn't ask. He goes out in his canoe with no idea what the weather's going to be. I was kind of startled to read a recent re interview with him where he describes himself as an optimist. He says, I need happiness in order to write well. Being depressed produces depressing literature. And I thought, yes, it really does. <laughs> it really does. I think a really good travel writer has to have some contentment in the traveling, in the fact of traveling. Uh, so that brings me back around to this, this sense of being foreign. If we, 
are excited about the idea of being global citizens and we want our boundaries to dissolve, then the sensation of being foreign is uncomfortable in a particular way. My favorite travel writer of all time is Eric Newby. Has anybody read Eric Newby? I recommend everything he wrote. I just finished his book, Slowly Down the Ganges. He uh, was in India during the war and became uh, fascinated with the river Ganges. And so in 1965, he drags his actually very sporty wife back to India and they decide to take a boat down the entire length of the Ganges, which is a pretty long way. In the first six days, they beached 65 times. They went through, I think, seven boats in the, in the course of this attempt. It was a complete disaster. It was just a series of total disasters. And he often had trips like this, where he just kind of gamely jumped into things he really wasn't prepared for. Um, so he's often quite cranky, and he, and he does sometimes hate the traveling, but he can't stop himself, and he never blames anybody else. And I think that's really key. He never, um, my favorite line of his from India, which I, I really understood after I'd been to India this winter was, um, in India you win every battle but the last one. <laughs> which is how it, they, they, there's a say, they often say it is impossible when you ask for something. But, um, but he doesn't take it out on the people around him. He, in 1958, he's in Istanbul and he gets to a town very late at night, uh, a little place right outside of Istanbul, very late at night and he can't, doesn't have any place to stay and, and a guide takes him to this sort of seedy guest house and all he says about it is, I prayed the hotel would be full but it wasn't. So he's bewildered and he's aggrieved but he never slanders other people for it. I'm also fond of a, a, a living writer, <laughs> at least one, named John Critch. Um, he's really a, a great example of travel writing as a detective story. Every one of his books, he's written many books, um, is looking for something in particular. He wrote an entire book about uh, seeking out the roots of Brazilian music, which took him all over Brazil. Uh, he wrote a book about um, traveling with Latin American baseball teams called El Baseball. He wrote a wonderful book called Wanton Lust in which he is, goes off uh, to Asia looking for the best Chinese restaurant in the world, which is basically an excuse to eat at a lot of Chinese restaurants. Um, one book in particular, Music in Every Room, is about his attempt to catch up with a girlfriend who broke up with him and she goes off to travel the world and he spends the entire book chasing her around the world. There's nothing on his mind but to follow her. It's kind of like the Yardbirds original vinyl. It got, that, that quest got me all over London. My first time to London, if you've ever been there, you get lost a lot in London between the underground and the uh, above ground, you'll know, <laughs> you know, you're, you're always lost and you have your ABC of London and um, I went to every secondhand record store I could figure out in the entire city and it was a great way to get to know London, to just go looking for one particular thing. I have a friend in uh, Scotland right now, she's going, they're going up to the Hebrides, they're gonna be stuck on one of the little Hebrides for a week and she's gonna try to figure out, find somebody to teach her to knit. That's her quest. Great place to learn to knit. So in January I went to India. I'd never been there before. Um, I went for several weeks. I went with a friend but he went ahead of time and went to Nepal and, our, and so we were meeting up in northeastern India. So, um, it's always exciting to go to a place you've never been before, completely alone, not speaking the language. That's, I think, a great way to travel. Um, so we were meeting in a little town called Bodh Gaya. And, uh, and this essay has found a home, by the way. It's going to be published. It's my first totally electronic publication, which I'm sad about, but it's the way of the world, on a new website called She Books, which is um, electronic long-form writing by women. I arrived in Bodh Gaya, the town that surrounds the site of the Buddha's enlightenment on New Year's Eve. 
The pilgrim's journey to Bodh Gaya often entails some hard travel along rough roads. Historical accounts invariably describe confusion, overcrowded trains, misdirection, long waits, late buses, blistered feet, and false leads, along with the constant worry of violent crime. The area was so lawless until a few years ago that foreigners were told not to travel at night at all. The road from the little airport six miles away passed flat checkerboard fields of blooming yellow mustard and deep green rice. Old buses, tiny cars, and three-wheeled motor rickshaws shared the narrow road with tall trucks swaying languidly from side to side under top-heavy loads of hay and firewood. My pilgrim suffering had more to do with transatlantic flights and jet lag. I'd flown into Delhi from the States and collapsed for half a night in a nearby hotel. It was one of the coldest days Delhi had seen in years, and the humid, dirty air had weight. On the way back to the airport in the morning, the taxi driver taught me to say, thank you, Danyavad, and ask if I was going to Bodh Gaya to pray. The proper answer would be, not exactly, but I said yes. Thomas hadn't planned his way from Nepal, but figured it would be a fairly simple matter, a train or two across the border through Patna, the capital of Bihar, to Bodh Gaya. It did not prove so. Finally, counting up the days and the hundreds of dollars involved in any combination of bus, train, and plane, he hired a driver. The intermediary said the trip would be four or five, maybe eight hours, depending on traffic. Nine hours into the trip, Thomas sent me a text. Traffic is terrible, very slow. I typed out an elaborate text message. My reply cycled for a few minutes before the error appeared, unable to send. That would be an ongoing theme, by the way. I settled into my hotel about a mile from the Mahabodhi Temple and headed out. In India, horns function as turn signals, brake lights, and hand gestures. I walked through an incessant choir of honking. Wisps of smoke hung in the misty air from stinking charcoal grills and cloying incense and little fires where people huddled along the road in the record-breaking cold. Black cows with short horns stood languidly, tied by ropes to small trees or stepped slowly along the road. Men sold ice cream from little coolers on the back of bicycles under the soft leaves of crepe myrtle trees. A line of scrawny, underdressed men played rhythm on an odd mix of plastic and tin buckets. Horse-drawn carriages and ancient bicycle rickshaws pedaled by ancient men joined the stream. A half dozen soldiers with rifles directed traffic with capricious waves and frowns. The noise and the crowd was flagrant, extravagant, a kind of living mural of human diversity and creative entrepreneurship. Lines of vendors sold pastries, bananas, jewelry, cheap hand luggage, recreational spice in lines of foil packets like condoms, potato chips flavored masala and tandoori, scarves and shawls, tiny tents for meditation, fruit and tea, and out-of-date guidebooks. The streets nearest the complex were tightly lined with heaped up tables and tarps with Buddha statues and rosaries and prayer wheels and incense burners and meditation cushions, Buddhist key rings, Buddhist coasters, Buddhist t-shirts, and optical illusion posters with the eyes of Hindu gods following you across the room. A man was being shaved by the side of the road, head tilted back and eyes closed as the barber scraped the creamy lotion off his neck. I walked in a bit of a daze, the fragments of expectation I carried with me, the quiet contemplation of history, silence in the shadow of the past, disintegrated like the dry leaves under my feet. I kept pausing to look around and get my bearings in the bracing crowd. Hundreds of people were walking up and down the road, paying no more attention to the traffic laws than the vehicles. Hindu men in wrinkled white shirts over long sarongs tied at the waist stepped deliberately as though they had walked for years, passing strolling Sikhs with colorful turbans and long beards. The women were a tropical aviary in clothes of every color and style, 
patterns piled on and wrapped around other patterns, pleated skirts with short, tight blouses showing midriffs of every shape, and the long tunics and loose trousers called salwar kameez. In the unusual cold, most were also bundled inside saggy cardigans with heavy brogans peeking out beneath fine silk pants. Bright-eyed, skinny kids begged from the pedestrians using the universal symbol, eat, eat. Here and there I saw elegant men in Ralph Lauren and the occasional Muslim woman in a dark abaya covering all but her face and hands. The throng was filled with Tibetans of all ages, a healthy diaspora wearing every shade of red and maroon and burgundy. Many young monks walked down the road hand in hand or stood gaily in the back of pickups, holding onto the roof and laughing as they weaved through the crowd. Four adolescent boys wrapped in maroon robes stood at a cart with an air rifle happily shooting at balloons. The Hotel Tathagata and Hotel Vipassana and Hotel Siddhartha were lit top to bottom with flashing Christmas lights. I saw signs for the Bright Career Institute, Soda Fever, the God Particle Institute for Physics and Math, and the Hungry Bite Family Restaurant. Great Buddha Gym for all men's and women's, I read from a poster tacked to a pole. Nearby, a dog with bloody genitals and three legs hopped toward a field. Thomas sent another text. Traffic at standstill in Patna for one hour. My reply, spend the night in Patna, it's okay cycled for a few minutes before the error message returned, unable to send. I walked wearily back to our hotel in the daunting Indian New Year's Eve, blooming with shouts and bonfires, heavy, damp explosions, and the prickle of firecrackers. Distorted Indian house music squawked out of overloaded speakers competing for the attention of whooping dancers. I passed an amusement park with hundreds of lights flashing and children going round and round on teeny cars. I walked past the fires and the barbers and the man selling pieces of an enormous white cake speckled with flies and the tin can drummers and the foreigner wine shop and a man slicing the throat of a struggling goat by the side of the road while four small boys watched in silence. Thomas arrived at last after midnight dazed and shimmering from a 16-hour ride with a Nepalese driver who spoke no English and didn't seem to understand his increasingly blunt gestures about toilets. He fell into a hard sleep in a room down the hall, but I woke several nights in the night to what sounded like cannon. Don't go to India on New Year's Eve your first night. That's part, it was quite amazing. I went to India as a Buddhist, um, I've been a Buddhist for 31 years, um, and as a Zen Buddhist, we don't really have a very strong concept of sacred sites, so it's not a really strong impulse for Zen Buddhists to go to these original sites of the Buddhist pilgrimage, although it is for most other Buddhists. So I went with, that's the idea of this um, quiet contemplation of history, was that there was, there was a certain intellectual impulse to this trip, and I, I found that um, it became a very heartfelt trip over time. Uh, this is the same experience I had when I first went to Florence. I'd been obsessed with Michelangelo from the time I was a teenager, just obsessed in a strange kind of way, and it took many years, it was probably 15 years before I could actually afford to get to Italy and get to Florence. Um, when I got sent by a magazine to write about going to a place you've dreamed of for a long time to see what the reality is compared to the dream. Um, and I had that same experience. I'd imagined Florence as a marble tomb, as a statue, as a painting, because I knew it only as Michelangelo. And when I got there and discovered it was actually this really busy, wild, modern city, um, that it was disjointed at first to bring the reality and the image together. And I had the same experience repeatedly at the Buddhist sites, expecting a contemplative experience and discovering the crowds and the noise and the, and the life in this place of history. 
it grew on me very quickly, and I, I would really like to get back. So there's another strange distinction that comes up with travel writing, and um, I'm sure you've all heard it. I'm a traveler, not a tourist. We really disparage the idea of being a tourist. Uh, and people who do what's called adventure travel are the worst in this way. They're much more demanding than the rest of us. And I think that the, the argument you hear is that tourists somehow um, land and take over a place and they make a demand on the place when in fact I think the opposite is true. Tourists are, if you've been to many tourist places, you know that places are very well uh, ready to receive tourists and they know how to receive tourists and, and groups of people often can come in, drop a lot of money, which is the point, have their experience and leave and really leave very few ripples in the stream. It's the singular tourist who shows up without reservations and expects to kind of get some attention from the locals. They're the ones that actually are making demands on a place. Um, there's something kind of sacred and masculine about these adventures that are cooked up for magazines and then turned into books because it's not the person putting themselves spontaneously in the way of this. They're creating, there's a constructed nature to the story. Um, it was Levi Strauss who called this kind of travel um, our kind of our puberty, that they were like um, initiation rites that we had to go through. As being as modern people used to conveniences, we had to put ourselves through these primitive initiation rites by running a wild river or climbing a mountain. And most of all, these adventure stories, misery loves the author, and there you have an investment in sort of creating disaster. Um, or taking a risk that is likely to pay off in a story. And I would argue that feeling foreign, feeling like a tourist, being seen as the, the foreigner is actually a crucial part of travel. I think it's a really important thing for us all to experience. And that means being a little lost, being confused, feeling conspicuous, being dependent on strangers, not knowing a lot of what's going on. Um, it's a really a central experience of travel. Um, in, in Uganda, I'm often the only white person. Um, my friend David, who I've been to Uganda with several times, is six foot three, bald, and very pale. And that's an experience a lot. You know, we, in Portland, in Milwaukee, we don't get that experience very often. We should have that experience. Um, the idea that I could go somewhere like that and try to pretend that I, I'm from around the corner, I can't. I just can't. Even if I'd been there for years, um, even if I spoke Lugandan well, um, it's still part of the experience. And somehow we've decided that it's a sign of weakness or some kind of lack of sophistication that, that you're seen as a visitor. But the traveler is actually pretty unimportant. To the, to the place. No one knows you, you can't blend in. And sometimes, often as not, you are there where nobody really cares what happens to you. Part of what I've discovered from travel is that 98% of the people in the world are good people, generous people, kind people, they're gonna help you out. And that's, uh, there's just about as much to worry about in Kampala as there is in Los Angeles or Chicago. Um, I carry myself pretty much the same way in Delhi and Kampala as I do in Chicago. Uh, and people are as kind and courteous or more so um, to me because they know I'm not from around here. So sometimes nobody really cares what happens to you unless you ask for help. And that's such a key experience for us. Travel requires tremendous trust. We have to trust the world in order to do it. And we have to be willing to look like a fool and be fools and make mistakes. It's really a great cure for a swollen head to get out there and, and travel. I often read Americans making a point of being dismayed at westernization and globalization of traditional cultures. 
And I, I did experience that. When I first got to Uganda, I was really startled by how much um, they wanted my stuff. And I never felt richer than when I got to Degea, the village that I, the first time. Um, and there was a part of me that was really bemoaning the Nikes on their feet and their desire for my iPod and um, Coca-Cola being sold in the little, in the little uh, shack stores. Um, but that's a way, we are proclaiming a different kind of superiority when we feel that way. Um, we're claiming the right to define what's proper for other people to have. And it's a little, it's, it's dangerous because it's subtle. It's, I, I had the thought and I've discovered a number of other people who've come to work in De Gea have had the thought of wanting them to delay getting electricity because the darkness is so potent. The darkness is so beautiful. The stars are beautiful. 12 hours of darkness every day of your life. It took me a little while to get whacked upside the head and realize what that meant and how that holds people back, how it affects health and economies and education and everything else. And they have electricity now and I'm really glad for them. And I'm a little sad because you can't see the stars quite as easily, but how can it be up to me to decide that what's better for them? Um, everybody in the world wants a cell phone. Everybody in the world wants a cell phone. Almost everybody in the world wants television. Um, they all want electricity. Um, and we find ourselves thinking, well, I'll give them money if they'll buy food. I want to presume to tell them how to spend it. So I, I think it's very useful to go and put yourself in their, in their lives, in other people's lives, whether it's Bend, Oregon, or Chicago, or Nigeria, and let them tell you what their lives are like. Pico Iyer, you've probably read. He's a really good writer and he's traveled a lot, but he's one of these global citizens and he can sometimes forget um, that most of us aren't. He said in a recent interview that people of sophistication should take 11 or 12 international trips every year. I know, and I read that and I thought, huh. <laughs> um, he does, he kind of forgot that he's one of the very few people in the world that can do that. And it's not just that you and I can't do that, but when we travel, we are traveling to people who for the most part don't go anywhere. Most people in this world are born and raised in the same place. They grow up near where they were born. They get married to people that grew up there. They spend their lives close to where they were born. Um, unless they leave that home to go to the city, the nearest city. But most people in the world are not making a lot of trips. We can travel because they're rooted. We can travel because people stay home. We travel because we want to see exotic places, and there really is no more relative term than exotic. It is only exotic to me. It's only exotic because it's relative to what I know. So what I'm trying to do in travel writing, you know, I said that the um, classic travel writers are not themselves the subject of the story, but of course, they are to a little extent because the good travel writers transform in the course of the journey. And to that extent, I am also the subject of my travel writing because my ignorance and my discoveries and my transformation, the little tiny bit of growth um, or character development that I can experience on a trip is part of that detective, st the detective story, that surprise that comes so when I travel, I always, I want to always, I want to quit traveling if I can't be surprised and excited and if I can't remember my great good luck in being able to go somewhere and if I can't always give people the benefit of the doubt and be willing to see what there is to see. 
I want to um, end with a, a, a little section about Varanasi. Do you know, um, you might call it Banares. Uh, Varanasi, also Koshi, it's a lot of names. Varanasi is maybe 5,000 years old. It's one of the oldest cities in the world. It depends on how you count years, I found, which is interesting. Um, it also depends on how you count cities, but it is definitely one of the oldest cities in the world. Um, it was an important Buddhist site. Um, it is now one of the most important Hindu sites. And when I thought about going to India, that was the first thing, more than the site of the Buddha's enlightenment or his death, that I wanted to see was, I want to go to Varanasi. I want to see that part of the Ganges where the rites are performed. Um, it had always really been kind of up in the top five. So we ended up spending quite, quite a few days there. Brace yourself, said Thomas's lonely planet guide. Be wary, said everyone. Trust no one. Hold on to your valuables with both hands. Keep your eyes open. Beware of con men and scam artists and pickpockets. Stay out of crowds. Don't give money to beggars or hire a guide off the street or wander back streets alone. I do not like Varanasi, said Umesh, our driver. Oh, I should have set this up. We ended up having to take to hire a driver because the trains were full because the fog and the cold had closed down a bunch of trains. So everything was just jammed and we couldn't get on the train. So we had to hire Umesh, who didn't like Varanasi and didn't want to drive there. But he got us there and handed us over to two uh, cycle rickshaw drivers. Whole other story, I don't like cycle. I don't like to be pulled or pushed by human labor. I find it an uncomfortable experience, but almost unavoidable in India. So Umesh handed us off to two cycle rickshaw drivers. We were fresh meat with luggage. The cyclists slowly pedaled between parked cars and the traffic, standing upright to get enough traction. The leader stopped and they consulted quickly and turned off the road down a street with scooters and cycles and no room for cars, and then into an alley paved with brick and cattle dung. The stone walls were painted with signs and advertisements. Again they stopped and asked a passerby and turned down a narrower alleyway, around a corner, stopped and carried the rickshaws up a step and down a narrower alley to the next corner. And at last we reached an alley too narrow for the rickshaws. We paid the drivers exactly what had been agreed upon and walked up a lane just wide enough for two to our hotel and the river below. The far side of the river is an empty plain waiting for the monsoon, the eternal flood plain of the Ganges. The whole city is jammed on the other bank. Varanasi has the wide green campus of Benares Hindu University, one of the great universities of Asia, and many middle-class housing colonies which combine shopping and residence far from the crammed banks of the river and a calm tree-lined set of streets known as the civil lines where the British once segregated themselves. But entire neighborhoods seem to be under both demolition and construction at once, buildings coming apart in slow explosions, half-dug ditches, broken pavement, construction sites, piles of brick and wood and rebar, and the old city piles up on one side of the river in a psychedelic tumble of sliding temples and tilted, decaying mansions carved into tiny apartments. From the river bank to my fourth floor room was 128 steps. The river is dark at night, sultry street lamps making pools of yellow light on the almost empty ghats. A ghat is a bathing place with steps down to the river. There were always a few cows, a few dogs, a few people loitering by the water couples and young men leading on the, leaning on the steps, and a few rowboats slowly sliding by. The crowds are at the Shashwa Med, the central ghat, bright and noisy in the middle of everything with nightly choreographed Hindu rituals performed by handsome young men who spin flaming lanterns in synchrony to the endless singing of a fine tenor in the center of a crowd of betel, betel, ven, betel nut vendors and flower sellers and boatmen and lepers 
whose hands fluttered like leaves to Nubi, and aimless young men and police and masseurs and barbers and cows and milling Indian tourists, many of whom seemed to know all the words to the chants. At Dashashwa Med on the first night, we were instantly picked up by a young fellow called Babu, who offered to help us find a good restaurant. By way of a reference, he said, I know Goldie Hawn. <laughs> Babu talked a lot. He was 20 years old, he said, a computer sciences major on New Year's break. His family owned a silk factory, and Goldie Hawn had been there seven times. We walked together up from the river into the crowded and more touristy streets above. Here we were brother and sister, Buddhists on tour. That made sense to Babu. We had to find a way to explain being an, uh, friends, because men and women can't be friends. It's, it was, we found it impossible to explain otherwise. I take you for no money because you are like my mama, he told me in a confiding tone. This is good karma. With pride, he pointed us to the door of the brown bread bakery, which to my dismay was yet another restaurant with a sign noting that it was highly recommended by Lonely Planet. As was generally the case, it wasn't as good as the little open-air restaurants where local people ate. Babu was waiting at the end of our meal and stuck with us all the way back down, past the curio shops and the pashmina stalls to the river. Goldie Hawn comes seven times to my shop, he told me, because our silk is made by hand. I take you to the factory. Goldie Hawn is Buddhist. She talked to Dalai Lama. He pulled out his phone. I have photo. I show you. After a few minutes of searching, he put the phone away. I have photo at home. Call me tomorrow. I take you to the factory. I take you for no money. Good karma. Along the river, I was always getting offers for boats, for pashmina, flowers, incense, guides. The children selling little floating baskets with a few marigold blooms and a candle were the most demanding. Good luck to you, your mother, father, sister, brother, husband, all family, good luck, rattled one urchin, long ago taught not to take no for an answer. I have nice candle, good luck to your family. Flower pudding ganga, good luck to your family. You have anyone have problems, say mother ganga, good luck. Every tourist town is built this way a torrent of things to buy that one does not really want, and the impossibility of finding things one really needs. Such is the call and response of salesmanship. The rhythm of peddling is the rhythm of survival, of getting by. In Varanasi, the irony is that tourists driven by fear-mongering websites and guidebooks congregate where they are told to congregate and are only exposed to what is designed for them. And it is there one finds the insistent touts and the scams. The stores sell dross instead of silk on ugly mannequins with Western features. And I spent many hours walking alone and unmolested in the narrow pedestrian alleys that wind in bewildering mazes, descendant passages of thousands of years. People live and work and shop here at little counters that sell tin boxes, spice packets, sitars, cell phones, potato chips, CDs, bananas, tiny sparkly skirts for your home deity, dosha and korma and salad. There are shops that seem to sell nothing but soda. The offers are quiet, made by polite clerks who never rise from their comfortable seats and are easily smiled away. Scarves, madam, pashmina. Whatever I needed, change, tea, directions, was easy to find. I never tired of the brightly lit silk rooms, white cotton futons covering the floor and stacks of neatly packaged fabric lining the walls. One slips off shoes, kneels on the futon, and waits for the clerk to bedazzle you with cottons and silks in every color and combination of colors spread out and running across the floor like a river of rainbows. We bought tiny bowls of ice cream at a little shop so we could each flirt a little with Sunil, the handsome owner with a Bollywood mustache and ta tailored skirt shirts. And one day a customer asked, where are you from? United States of America, I said. I know America, he beamed, arms up in delight. I go to Miami many times. Miami is a beautiful city. Many celebrities there know me. Goldie Hawn, Michael Jackson, they know me. All my Indian acquaintances seem to know Goldie Hawn, I said. 
No, no, she only knows two people here, me and my cousin brother. I have photo, proof. And that's my talk. So that's all I have. <laughs> uh, but I don't know how many more people in India know Goldion, but I just thought it was hysterical that I met these people. Yes? Question. Yes? Have you ever been to Denmark? Uh, no, just uh, the Netherlands, Holland. I suggest you go 4th of July. <laughs> Is it like New Year's, like, like New Year's yeah. Eve? Yeah. Well, I'm supposed to go to Finland in the fall, but that's the idea is to go after the dark. I've never been to the northern climates in the summer, which I would like. Helsinki is a beautiful yeah, town. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'd like to go everywhere. I want to go everywhere. So. Yeah, and then, yeah. go ahead. Do you tell the stories of people that aren't in the tourist industry? Um, that you meet along the way? In India? Yeah, I was actually doing research for um, a, a story for Harper's when I was there, and I spent time out in the country. I spent also spent time up in the um, a little mango farming village up there, um, and that was really great. Yeah, you wanna? I mean, we were there as tourists, so you tend to encounter that. But by all the books, every website, everything says don't go alone into these shopping alleys, and they are exactly where the life is. And I was, we were perfectly safe. People seemed surprised that we could spend weeks in India and never have a single negative encounter, but we didn't. Babu was the worst, actually. He, he put a tracking device on me, I swear, because we ran into him everywhere in the entire city. But, um, and he was always like, come to my factory. Um, and that, the little urchin got mad at me when I didn't give him more money. But um, those are the worst things. But yeah, I, I uh, had arranged with um, a couple of NGOs to, to go out with some of them to do some research for a story I'm doing about um, toilets, sanitation issues um, in the world. So, yeah. It was so cold, though. Everybody was freezing. Did that last young man have a picture of Billy Holman? No, story? no. He just has photo proof at home. <laughs> They all do. I mean, he didn't, he didn't know that Michael Jackson was dead. It's just, <laughs> I, was, I was also struck that I could not say I was from the U.S. That didn't mean anything to people. And United States didn't mean anything to most of the people who would ask where we were from. To, to, um, to them, we, were, we could have been Australian or German or Danish or, or whatever. So I learned to say America. That made sense. Uh, or United States of America. They, they understood that. In, in Africa, I asked my friend um, Richard, I was walking down the road with Richard, who's about 25, um, with an East Indian medical student and a Korean nurse and me. And I said, how do we look to you? And he said, we looked the same to him. He couldn't tell that we were three different races at all. But he could tell a Bugandan from a Bunyoro from an Nkoli without any trouble at all, three different tribes in Kampala. That's just one of those examples of how exotic is such a relative experience. After six years, I can start to tell a Bugandan from a Bunyoro, but he can't tell a Korean from a, from a very white woman, so. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, we were Americans. Yes? Are you working on more than one story? Oh, yes, always. This has been kind of, it's been, uh, I was really sort of blocked for a couple years and couldn't get traction on much of anything. It's very frustrating. And then when the log jam breaks, it tends to, everything comes pouring out. So right now I'm actually working on a collection of um, connected essays on a theme. So I'm working on about eight things at the same time for that. Um, I'm working on um, this big story for Harper's about global sanitation and doing without a toilet. I was working on this. And I just finished the, the India story, which is going to be called Great Buddha Gem for All Men's and Women's um, and Beyond She Books. So yeah, I'm usually, I'd say I've usually got, I always have about eight essays that are not quite finished, that are not quite ready to be finished, that are, um, I haven't gotten to the point where I 
have solved them completely yet. Um, and one thing that's really hot to get worked on, and but if that answers your question. Yeah, I also have four unfinished book manuscripts in boxes and yeah, lifetimes of work. So, any other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm this kind of weird animal where I knew, I dropped out of, I went to college when I was 16, I dropped out of high school, I went to college, dropped out of college after two years, and the one and only writing teacher I've ever had in my life told me, what are you doing here, you should be a writer, get out of here, go be a writer, um, which is good advice. Um, and I didn't want to get an MFA, and I didn't want to write for a newspaper, and I just wanted to be a writer. And I realized I needed to figure out some way to pay the rent. And way back then, 30 years ago, it was actually it was uh, a lot easier to get into nursing school and get into that career. Um, so I got a degree in nursing. So I could work part-time, I could work weird shifts, I could quit, I could travel, I could go back to work. I, so. Um, it was a really good way for me to to pay the rent and not have to do it through writing. I did quit nursing for 11 years and support myself as a writer, um, and it became a constant hustle. And it starts to deform your voice unless you're unless you're being very well paid to write what you want. You have to hustle, and it's worse now than it was 10 years ago, and it is just going to get worse, I think. Um, electronic publishing pays you about 10% of what print publishing pays. So I would have to be writing 10 times as much as I'm writing to support myself that way. So I went back for the health insurance and for, for the uh, freedom not to lie awake at night worrying about it. So I work part-time. I work as a palliative care and hospice nurse part-time. So. And I've come to believe that it's really good to get out of your head. It's really good for writers and artists of all kinds to not just be obsessed with their own ideas and their own vision all the time, but to go do something for other people and, and spend eight hours thinking about everybody else instead of your stuff. Um, it's, it's just good character development, among other things. So. Any other questions? Well, I, I resonated with the the stuff you were saying about the modern travel writers. I've read two books in the last few years that there are people that are real introverts traveling the world and they encounter people that they that I would probably talk to if I were in their shoes, but they don't want to. And one guy just went all the way across Africa without talking to anybody. And another guy went through uh, Russia and just insulted them as he went. Yeah. And I, I was just so appalled that they uh -huh. didn't get their work published. That alone claim. Snarkiness is really in fashion right now. It really is. Um, I'm actually, uh, it may not, I mean, I'm not afraid to be, do, be, to do public speaking, but I'm really pretty introverted. I like to be alone. And um, Thomas and I had two disagreements. You know, we've been friends for a long, long time, and we traveled really well together, but we had two disagreements. One is, is it sacred or not? Which we had as a healthy debate the whole time. And the other one was him saying to me, you should be more ambassadorial. That's the way he put it. You should, you should strike up more conversations, give people your email, go home with people for supper. And I just get worn out after eight hours uh, in a city or eight hours seeing new things and overstimulated, and I don't want to do that. But he'd go off drinking beer till midnight with people, and I did meet a lot of people, but um, I just need that much time alone, so it has to be a balance. And then he's like, you should never have given Babu your phone number. <laughs> it's your fault he's following us around. My one attempt to be ambassadorial didn't, uh, didn't pay off. I did meet a, a really wonderful young Muslim woman who taught me to wear the abaya correctly, which I'd never known how to do. When we, when we went to Lucknow, Lucknow is a very uh, Muslim city. And, uh, um, and I, was all, I wore a scarf, pretty much a headscarf, whenever we were in the uh, bazaars in the old cities, because it just felt more comfortable. 
Um, but I didn't know how to pin it correctly. So I had a nice afternoon in a perfume shop getting properly dressed. So, yeah. I was watching Little League games, uh, which I do almost every summer, uh, the championship, uh, the World Series, I mean, and 2012, Uganda had yes. a team. You know that. Uh, not many people know that. Yes. El Baseball. Um, Uganda has its first Little League team, and it was actually the second, their second attempt to come. The first time they couldn't come because they couldn't get visas because most of them didn't have birth certificates. So it took them over a year to get permission to get visas to leave the country. But yes, it's, it's baseball as diplomacy. One of the boys that they were interviewing uh, in the dining hall, and then he said, when they said sloppy joes, he said, "I didn't. Li I didn't think I'd like it, but they're good." Yeah. Yep. He says, "I like them." Yeah. These are these are really poor kids. These are kids from the slums of Kampala that have been pulled out to be part of this project. It's, there's also one of the um, world champion junior chess players is from the slums of Kampala as well. She just uh, somebody was smart enough to see that the get that the girl had talent. And there's a really good book about her called The Queen of Katwe, and what what her experience was coming to New York for a chess championship from there. So I can see people, it's well, probably 8 o'clock. It's only 8.15, so oh. it's 10 after. Oh, so my goodness. Yeah, I need to, too. So, thank you yes. so much. Thank you.